many of you will know or remember the UCLA men's basketball coach John Wooden, who was a legendary figure in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, he led a series, he led Good morning, Roger. Good morning. How are you today? Great. Good. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see you. How are you? Is it nippy in here? Should I turn on the fire? Well, I, I was just glad I was able to get it off and, and uh, not burn down the building last week. So. <laughs> Yes, that's always a good thing when you come back to the church and still stand. There we go, looks good. Very cheery. Yeah, that'll be welcoming, I think, to folks. Um, I hope Nathan gets here. Go. Oh, did you see Nathan Black on his way at all? I did not. Not one of the members of the choir, but we don't see Nathan. So we will hope, trust, and pray. <laughs> you see being changed? Yes, Nathan is doing the presentation, and in his absence, I'm sure we can all reflect on discipleship and what that means. We can. Yeah. yeah. Really follow, good. follow the way of Jesus. So yeah. we can we will make do. It doesn't look like we've got online yet. People are probably still finding the link. But we're two or three are gathered. Don is here. Well, so who will be Yeah, particularly when Roger's here. Yeah, that'll <laughs> <laughs> yes. That assures him. Yeah. That, that's very good help. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I you never really know who's going to turn up. I hope they do come. Well, we can do what we talked about in terms of video. Yeah, I've got that queued up and ready to go. So we can we can start with the bishop's so we discipleship. Can, yeah, so we can start yep. a few minutes late we'll start Yep. We'll just start at nine with the video. With whomever joins us on the screen. I know Jan and um, Dave Brousseau are regulars. Mm -hmm. Right. And Beth Bowman comes often too. So 
Hopefully they'll be here. Yeah. Who's, who's doing the small group coordination? That's shifting. Um, Judy Stack was doing it uh, for the pandemic, well, the first part of the pandemic. But the spiritual life group is, is having a meeting this Wednesday. And Leanne Schmidt is really taking over. Morning. Good morning. morning. How are you, Nathan? All right. Yourself? Yeah. Yay. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Nathan? Good. How are you? Good. Doing well, thanks. I have the bishop's address uh, queued up to begin. Beautiful. Um, and then after that, maybe an opening prayer. And then it's, you have the, the floor. Awesome. Wonderful. And do you need any technology things, or is it analog? Um, I was thinking that there is a um, a walking, which is like a five minute. I don't know if we'll need it or anything, but uh Han Han has a five minute video on YouTube of just him explaining the walking meditation. Okay. And I thought, but there's a lot of rich conversations, so that may not be needed. Okay. But if necessary, yeah. just feel free to. Yeah. yeah Maybe if Scott uses Chrome. Um, so I've got. I've got the bishop's video queued up already, mm -hmm. but we just open up a new tab and then you just find it on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. I'll just look at that setup just in case we do want to use that. Just in case, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do anything. I think if you if it's up and ready, then just head back. <laughs> welcome, Dave. Welcome, Jan. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I think people will probably start joining. Us. I, what? Give people a couple more minutes, but find the video that you need, Nathan, and then just have it queued up in case you need to refer to that. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. There. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, then it is nine. I think we might just start with um, sharing the address, but first I'll just welcome everyone. Just to make sure that everyone can see the room. Uh, welcome, Jan and Dave again. Welcome all of those gathered here at the Fireside Room. Jay, good to see you. Nathan, thank you for being uh, the presenter this morning and leading our conversation. Matthew and Roger, welcome you all. Um, as we all know, this is the third part of a four-part series focused on the four priorities that have been set for the Episcopal Church in Minnesota and the network of faith communities in our diocese. And this morning's conversation focuses on discipleship, following the way of Jesus. And so I'll begin with a video from our Bishop, Craig Lawyer. This comes from the diocesan convention address where the Bishop set forth these four priorities for our diocese. So we'll just share the screen here, and make sure that I have the audio correctly. Um, I've got to do share screen, go here, and then optimize the video clip, and maximize the screen. All right, and, and here we go. Here is the bishop's address. Many of you will know or remember the UCLA men's basketball coach, John Wooden, who was a legendary figure in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, he led a series of basketball teams to national championships in an unprecedented streak. And part of the mythology about John Wooden is that every year when he had these national championship basketball teams, he would do exactly one thing on the first day of practice. He would teach the team how to put on their socks 
and how to tie their shoes in the right way. And his point was that winning national championships in basketball is about learning how to do the smallest possible things as well as they can possibly be done. That's how discipleship works. Mother Teresa once famously said, you don't have to do great things. You just have to do small things with great love. Returning to the basics of discipleship is the small thing that we do to join God in the great work of changing the world with love. I have found over and over and over in every place that I have been that what people most long for in the church is spiritual depth. Support in discovering how the God we encounter in scripture and in sacrament actually matters and makes a difference in our lives and in the world. And we find that depth by focusing on the practices that help us follow Jesus as a whole way of living in the world, dwelling in scripture, regular prayer, gathering together for worship, serving with the poor and the marginalized. My best hope for the Episcopal Church in Minnesota is that in the years to come, we will focus less on preserving a particular form of our institution and focus more on simply practicing and living the way of Jesus together. This will look like every individual and every community committed to praying daily so that our lives might render a sense of God's peace and presence in our daily living. And we might be able to recognize the spirit when we see her in the world and in the lives of our neighbors. It looks like dwelling in scripture as individuals and, as, and every time we gather so that our whole minds and souls might be shaped by the story of God's love that we meet there. It looks like every single one of us in our own context, loving and serving with the poor and marginalized. It looks like recommitting to following the simple rules of life like we find in gospel-based discipleship or in the way of love. We're being asked the question this morning, will you join the Spirit in returning to following Jesus as a whole way of life? When we start there, deeply rooted in Jesus and well-practiced as disciples, then we're able to go out and join the Spirit in the world in three ways. The first, is in faithful innovation. Stop sharing the screen here. And now I turn the floor over to this morning's presenter and uh, Nathan Black will be leading our conversation. Thank you. If everyone in the room is, is safe, is happy and content to that, then yes. Does, does anyone have any objections to Nathan speaking without his mask? Right. Yes, then go ahead, Nathan. Um, let's, let's just start with a, a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that we would hear what you would have for us to hear. That we would go where you are calling us to go. That we would listen how you would have us listen. That we could be your hands and feet in the world. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I um, was reflecting on the discipleship in these past couple of weeks on my um, how it was introduced and how it was taught it, as a young person in more of a conservative, um, non-denominational kind of world. Everything in that context was about saving the lost. Um, 
discipleship was um, a soul winning tactic. Um, uh, you know, and my, um, so I'm reflecting on the, on and how it was then and, and how it, how I'm understanding discipleship now as I've grown and as I've, uh, my faith has changed and deepened. I, um, N.T. Wright talks about, he was at Fuller Seminary and talking about discipleship and he, um, he it was kind of like pretty blunt. He said that, you know, you're probably expecting some grand uh, theological discourse, but it's really very, very, very simple. And Bishop Lloyd basically, he did my lecture for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, um, discipleship is very simple. It's, it's, it's your own spiritual growth. It's, it's your own spiritual practices, leading, re reading the Bible, learning the Bible, getting it as deep in your spirit uh, as possible. Everything from, um, uh, uh, he, he said basically to, as for, for those of you that are younger, um, and even, even uh, younger than I am, um, <laughs> to work on memorizing and, you know, and learning the stories so that they're natural, they're just part of your everyday, um, they're, they're in your consciousness. And then the second thing he, he emphasized was prayer. Uh, to be a disciple is to, to someone that has an active relationship with God, an active prayer life. Um, and so I've got some reflections on, on prayer and, and how that looks for me these days. The third thing he mentioned um, was an emphasis on the sacramental life. The, to be a disciple is to, is to participate, to, to be re, refilled, reconnected, re, um, reconnected to God and uh, to not, not, um, to not uh, fall away from, 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 the, from the Eucharist, from, from receiving and, and being fed by the table. And the fourth thing he, he said was ministry to the poor. Um, he, I forgot who he, he, who he was quoting, but he said that the, the, the outstretched hand of the beggar is the altar of the Lord. That really struck me. And so if discipleship is, is simply just the basics, you know, it's um, the, the emphasis that I was raised with is that we are out, we're to go out and make disciples. There was less of a practice, less of a, an awareness of what it is to be a disciple. And my, um, um, So if discipleship is about relationship and discipleship is about accountability and um, being known and knowing, it takes, it takes a vulnerability, it takes an intimacy, it takes courage. Um, you know, my, uh, being somebody that's like, a, you know, I'm in leadership or I'm in the discernment process, I'm serving as a chaplain, I have all these different areas of life where I'm accountable to spiritual leaders. I'm accountable to, to, to Father Jared, to the bishop, to my boss, to other chaplains. Um, I have these, these people that are contributing to me, that are guiding me, that are, um, that are discipling me. And that is part of the, the, the source that is filling me up so that when I'm out with people, I have something to give. I have something to share, to, to provide to people. I can begin to disciple those in my life, those that I encounter. Um, there's, a few, there's a few interesting, as a chaplain, there's a few interesting, we call them interventions. Uh, in the medical world, every, whenever you're charting your patient visits, they're the most, one of the most important parts is what intervention did you take? Did you, was it a you know a new prescription, a new diagnosis? Was it a um, you know a new care plan, something like that? And chaplains have I'm like, okay, we need to have our own interventions so that we can communicate, try to communicate what it is that we're doing in a way that the medical world can understand. And there's two that we use very commonly: um, active listening and a ministry of presence. And these are um, so active listening is. It's very common, like in the in the therapeutic world, um, 
I'm sure I'm sure a lot of us have heard have heard um, you know listen listen intently listen deeply. Um, but active listening is is a practice of of being with someone and listening listening to the to the whole person using your body to listen using uh, your heart to listen listening to what's being said listening to what's not being said listening for context listening for past listening deeply and the ministry of presence is a it's a practice of um, of of being of, of of simply being there. Most of the time, um, I think we have a. Uh, it's hard for us just to show up and just to be when we can't do, when there's nothing that can be done, nothing that can be said. We don't know what to say. But the the practice of simply being there with someone who is in pain, with someone who um, is, is suffering or with someone who's hungry, with someone who, who is, is, is experiencing the weight of, of the systemic um, uh, pain that, that so many in our society are experiencing. They're dealing with things that we can't, we can't fix. We can't you know, pull out our, our wallet or we can't you know, uh, cook a meal and, and, and it takes something to touch that kind of pain and just be with them. So that's the, the ministry of presence. Um, this week, I, I did a funeral. I got to know a, a man, gentleman who, um, very humble, very quiet. And I learned that this guy had uh, been a part of the recovery community in Owatonna for 35 years. Um, he was known in, in the community in town in general as the father of AA, the father of recovery community in Owatonna, beloved by uh, everyone that knew his name, just, just their lives had been touched and changed. And, and as a model of discipleship, I just have been blown away by, by his testimony and his witness. Um, I, uh, On um, so we did we did the funeral on Friday and then the, there was a celebration of life on Saturday, um, and one of the the women got up to read a selection of the from the big book uh, on the day that he passed, and it was a re reflection that um, really emphasized looking looking towards heaven for hope and and they were um, they all knew him and loved him and trusted him and felt safe. Uh, his backyard was was kind of the, the um, their 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 home, their home away from home. Everyone felt welcome there. But he wasn't someone that was preachy. He wasn't someone that that um, they didn't really know a lot about his faith. And um, when I was with his family, one of his daughters was going through his things and found his Bible, and she was took her breath away. How well worn his Bible was. And you know, had highlighted and notes, and and they had no idea uh, his his own deep spiritual practices, his own love for God, his own. I mean, they, they knew to to an extent, but it wasn't. They didn't know because he was overt and and you know um, in a way that we might we might think of. Um, I was really really inspired by that and. I actually invited the family to bring that Bible. Um, they chose some, some scripture readings that, that he had emphasized in, in the text himself. And we invited his grandchildren to come up and read those from his actual Bible. And it was just this incredibly moving experience of being reminded of the importance of the, our, personal, uh, our personal walk with God. But discipleship is, is a... Um, um, it's a practice that we're all called to. We're all called to these things. It's not just the priest. It's not just the ministry leader. It, oh, it's not just Siri. <laughs> um, and when, you know, we we may doubt we may doubt our own gifts, our own uh, abilities to to be that for someone else. 
But Jesus didn't call the polished and professional. He didn't call the, the well-educated, the well-to-do. He didn't, he called fishermen. And um, uh, Bishop Perry was commenting on how, you know, these, these fishermen, you know, they were professional. This was their livelihood. This is what they did. But um, he had to tell them how to fish over and over again. So maybe they weren't even very good fishermen. <laughs> and, you know, so the, like we're, we're, we're all called to be disciples. We're all called to, to treat our own relationship with God as if it is the only lifeline that someone else may have. That they're, we're the only light that they may experience, the only love that they may encounter. And, and we're called to make disciples. We're not called just to be a disciple, but we're called to make disciples. Um, and I, this, um, this centurion said, you know, when he came to Jesus, um, asking for a prayer for his servant who's sick, his beloved, uh, he said, I too am a man under authority. He was clear about relationship, clear about authority, clear about the importance of, of support and, and, and being connected to something bigger than, than ourselves. And discipleship is that, that kind of thing. You know, we're, who, who is looking to you for comfort, for guidance, for inspiration? Who in your family, um, you know, they call you or they're open to you whenever you call? Who, who in, your, in your workplace, you know, uh, responds when you offer that, that kind word, that kind encouragement? Um, these are the people that God is calling us to disciple, to, to love. Um, and these are, discipleship is practical. The, the, outward, the outward living out what it means to be a disciple isn't, isn't necessarily preachy, isn't necessarily, you know, um, uh, maybe look like holy work. It, it, it's really offering water, offering a meal, offering companionship, comfort encouragement, um, being, being that one that can, uh, you know, be around someone's pain and not try to fix it or not try to run from it, not try to deny it. Um, someone whose faith is, is deep and, 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 and can give you the courage to encounter that pain around you um, and know that God can work through you to meet those needs. Um, I can mute. Yeah. Welcome, Juanita. Would you mind muting? Thank you. I'm curious. Um, when you when you think about discipleship, who have who have you been discipled by? Who have are there any special um, experiences that you've had um, with people in your life? Maybe people not even connected to the church that, that you have been reminded of God or you have um, been taught or led by or fed by. My grandmother. Mm. My mother's mother. Sunday in my grandmother's home was time sort of stopped. You know, we heard the church bells ring. She turned on the radio, which is always a live even song from like one of the great English cathedrals. And this is bizarre because this is in Harare. <laughs> this is in, you know, Zimbabwe, in Arcadia, which is where the mixed race people live. And St. Andrews is maybe two blocks away from my grandmother's house. But I would, I, the Saturday before Sundays, we, I would sit at the piano and play and my grandmother would arrange the flowers every Saturday before Sunday morning. And Father Forbes, you know, he would wait for the people as they were coming in and he would be ringing the bell and if you were late, you know, Father Forbes would call you out. Um, but in the space, just watching my grandmother's hands on the prayer book and on the hymnal, and just how my grandmother exuded this love of Jesus and the love of people in the community, um, that much like the, the person you're speaking of in Owatonna, you know, Ramona Abrahams in Arcadia was the woman who arranged the flowers. And it was through that devotion 
um, to creating beauty in the sanctuary of God, um, and just how my grandmother comported herself that I, I sort of had that first imprint of this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to follow the commandment of Jesus, to love God and to love your neighbor. Um, so that was my first person who discipled me, I guess, was my grandmother. It's true for me. Um, my mother was the oldest of three girls, and uh, her mother, uh, she was baptized, all three girls were baptized uh, in the Catholic Church. Um, my grandmother uh, served as her husband in the family, probably followed his marriage vows, uh, and uh, he, he, he was a comfortable in the Catholic Church. Um, so when my mother and I came to the first communion time, which was age six in the Catholic Church, my grandmother talked to my grandfather and said, oh, we must find a church where the girls would be comfortable. And um, that's why I'm this one. Uh, and my uh, grandma was a rock as far as I'm concerned. She never complained one bit. I never, I never questioned why she, why is grandma going to be Catholic Church? Um, she was just, and my grandfather became a very good Episcopalian. He served right up to his death, uh, and he would go, he'd come to go to the early service and then go home and, and take her to church. And often, my mother said, often he would go in and, and worship with her. So there wasn't uh, that. I, I, I guess I haven't, I, I really appreciate your invitation here because I haven't, I, I always revered her, um, but I didn't recognize her as that's. It probably is the reason the church is so many. Yeah, absolutely. Just a reminder to speak up because I've been on the Zoom call and it's really hard to hear people in the room. So just a reminder, it's hard for them up there. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, theater voice. <laughs> for me, there's been multiple people in different times and places. Um, that, and you know, I, I grew up in an environment similar to yours where discipleship was almost like street corner evangelism. Mm -hmm. But even even in that context, there were there were, were people who um, somehow the the fact that Jesus loved me came through despite a lot of the negative. Yeah. Uh, context and it's hard to identify when or who that came from but it it did or the Holy Spirit was talking yeah. but in in college I had a uh, it happened to be a pastor who really made significant changes and and for many years I was uh, involved in young life uh, as, as a ministry that Teens and uh, a couple of those uh, area directors were really, really taught me a lot, not only about myself, but about um, how do you how do you reach out to the unknown to anybody who shows up, yeah. no preconceptions about who belongs there, but, yeah. and then on a separate level, they also really modeled uh, discipling, sort of an introduction to it that I'd never been exposed to. Yeah. And there's more, but that's a start. Definitely. I, I'm resonating with both of your stories, and I was a Royal Ranger in a Assembly of God uh, tradition as uh, kind of like Boy Scouts, um, except more of Jesus. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a gentleman in Ray High Saw who is, uh, we call them commanders, who is like one of the, the leaders, um, uh, retired man that kind of took all of us under his wing. And, and he has, uh, I just remember him being so gentle and so patient with us. And, you know, as worked up or rambunctious or whatever trouble we might be getting into, his just, gentle loving presence would uh we, we would we would uh, it just it just made such a huge difference at the 
the energy would would lessen and <laughs> you know things would calm and uh i remember he he just made a huge impact on so many people's lives um any other thoughts about discipleship or experiences you have uh, you know thinking about this I'm, I'm sure it's a common experience that we've all had to see people in church communities who just radiate this kind of, of um, service. Uh, and one of, in our former community was um, a man who was just devoted to serving and outreach. Yeah. And it was inspiring and it set an example and um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was simply a wonderful experience. Yeah. In, in speaking to the first, the first part of uh, discipleship in terms of the inward, mm -hmm. our responsibility mm -hmm. for taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I've been reading the book we read together on, on, this, on discernment mm -hmm. by Henri Nouwen. And he, he has uh, a thought, you know, he's, for, for sin, we usually consider sex, money, and power to be primary. Mm -hmm. But he, he sort of postulates, I, I really think the, the most prevalent, largest sin uh, in the church today is uh, lack of, lack of self-worth, how we view ourselves and treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really prominent or, or revealed in the, the, the second part of um, what Jesus says is love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And how many people can't love themselves or ex don't express that? And, and there's, uh, there's a particular time where I, that was really revealed to me, and well, over time. Yeah. But um, so, so part of taking care of you, one of the majors is are you taking care of yourself is can you love yourself? Because if you can't, you can't love any around you. Absolutely. I've been thinking about how I've been discipled by people who have no awareness that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. right. and, and even in the case of some people that they're dead, <laughs> that is to say there they're, are figures from the past whose works I come back to over and over again. I was thinking about um, since I was introduced to someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, when I was 18 years old. I mean, I've read Life Together, I don't know how many times, a discipleship, ethics. Um, and there's been a way in which an in integration of uh, Christian faith and the world and and thinking about how we connect those things um, uh, and also the, the danger of what he calls cheap grace. You know, that, that's been a, a formative collection of ideas. The other person is still living and, and uh, would be very surprised to know that he's been a, a formative Christian uh, emphasis of discipleship. And that's the Kentucky farmer and writer Wendell Berry uh, who has been tremendously important to me and formative. I used to do a seminar on Wendell Berry and uh, I read and reread and reread his stuff, his poetry, short stories. Um, the other book that I read every year uh, is Doug Homershold's Marking. Uh, again, a man who wanted to, to integrate a profound Christian faith that many people are not aware of in his life with his uh, work and society for peace. Um, and, and these people have discipled me without knowing me or being aware of it. And I suspect there are other, many of uh, others that have done the same for you, particular people that you come back to that become formative in your thinking, not always right, uh, not always helpful, uh, but at the same time, challenging and re-challenging you to think through who it is you are, particularly in the intersection of Christian and the world, which all three of these people 
did for me and do for me. Uh, and, and Barry and, and, the, and the natural world and the creation itself, and, um, and Hammarskjöld and in interaction with the international world and efforts of peace and political efforts. Um, and then uh, Bonhoeffer, in, in a sense, in, in both of those things, and also in the inter interaction with the scripture, uh, thinking about his uh, in second half discipleship, his work on so. Thank you. I'm going to add, uh, add to that that I think I've also been mentored by books a lot. Um, and uh, when you hit that book, it just um, coalesces with your own experience, your own doubts, your own thing, your own anxieties. Um, it's just magical. And I, my absolutely favorite theological book of all time for me is by a poet and Christian Wyman's, who is my go to guy for almost every every sermon, every, um, and he came from a point of just not being very agnostic, very skeptical, very, very much anchored in the arts, which was a start anyway, but he um, got cancer and through that started asking some tough questions. And the way that he came to religious faith, so was such an example for me that it, it just, it's funny, it sustains me all the time. And the guy's alive, but I certainly don't know that. Fabulous poet. Oh, just amazing. My God, yeah. And essays too. Yeah, the essays. My list of books to read is growing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my bright abyss. My bright abyss. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, just a stunning book. The um, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that fourth element of that N.T. Wright focused on the ministry to the poor. That um. You know, we, um, I don't know, like I, I am often surprised by how I'm discipled by uh, these uns unsuspecting uh, persons that may not even know they're discipling me. Uh, but often those experiences happen with people who are vulnerable, people who are on the margins. Um, my work with uh, uh, being a part of Black Lives Matter, being a part of the Poor People's Campaign, um, uh, feeding hungry people, um, being with people that are, are brokenhearted after uh, a, a terrible death, um, you know, whether it's uh, violence or um, uh, death by the, the, the state in some manner. There, um, I've, I've been so moved by the hospitality and the welcome of people who have every reason to distrust someone who looks like me someone who comes from uh, the institution of church like me. Um, and they, they open their hearts and they open, they, they open their, their, uh, their space and their spirit to, to, to let me in and just be with them. And then I find in this, the, this relationship of discipleship is, it's not, it's not a, while, while there is accountability and everything, it's not a top down. I think when Jesus, you know, was with the disciples, he, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. He was talking uh, in their language, but I think, I think that had to have expanded something for him, you know, getting in their world and, and talking about what, what this mission is in a way that they could hear. I know that had to have, you know, filled his own heart. And I have that experience um, in surprising ways with people that, that, um, I, that I think we're called to. Jesus is talking about the dividing the sheep from the goats, and you know, I, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. Those practical, those practical ways of, of encountering the pain of the world and and doing something about it. Um, that um, that is the uh, the. It's like the what next of the first part of discipleship. And I think that it, it, our, our faith, our, it, our, our discipleship isn't complete until we have that kind of intimate uh, experience that you know, that is part of our story, our life, our, our daily. We're talking about the, the kind of the greatest sins that we might experience and um, 
you know, the the world ranks or the, the larger church maybe ranks morality around, you know, sexual sin, relationships sin, and those kinds of things. And, and while yes, um, the poor people's campaign frames sin uh, in, in this collective systemic way. You know, like it's not a sin to be poor, but poverty is a sin that we allow uh, people to not have homes, that we allow people to not have health care. Uh, that is a that is our sin as a society, as a collective. And what does it take to encounter that kind of sin and and to 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 bring bring the gospel to that, to to work to change those things? Um, I think that's all wrapped up in this in this this idea of discipleship. Um, I, so. In this this humility, this kind of being open to uh, to being being taught and discipled by other people, other traditions. I wanted to. I have a friend, uh, Brother Chai Sing Lee. Um, I got to know him in Dallas and uh, Austin, and he's a Buddhist uh, student of Thich Nhat Hanh. And uh, he he passed away from cancer a few years back. Um, young guy is is, is my age. Um, but his his love for Thai was just so extraordinary. I wanted to, um, uh, so I was raised in a you know we're gonna go on prayer walks and we're gonna we're gonna plead the blood of Jesus over the city. We're gonna you know bind bind up the principalities and powers and we're gonna you know we're gonna save save our city. And uh, so this idea of praying without ceasing and praying wherever you are and praying you know while you're working is it's just been kind of a part of my. The way I was raised, but uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has a walking meditation that um, is the Buddhist uh, approach to this ever-present mindfulness, even even when walking. And I'd like to share that with you. Do we have time for that? It makes sense. Like yeah. Four minutes. Yeah. Do the screen share thing. Oh, uh, so Nathan, <clears throat> be sure to share the screen so those folks at home. All right. Yeah. Okay, then you just need to hit. Um, yep. Well, uh, practicing walking meditation is to practice meditation while you walk. And uh, you can be peaceful and happy during the practice. And uh, you walk and uh, you, do, you do it uh, as if you are the most, the happiest person in the world. And if you can do that, you succeed in walk in meditation. <laughs> because we do not set ourselves a goal for a uh, particular destination, so we don't have to worry uh, to hurry. Uh, because there is nothing there for us to to get. Therefore, uh, walking is not uh, a means but uh, an end by itself. So each step you make must uh, make you happy, peaceful, and serene. And each step brings you back to the present moment, which is the only moment in which you can be alive. Uh, make steps as if you print your foot on the ground. And uh, you do not print your anxiety and sorrow on the ground. Instead, you print, you print peace, serenity, and happiness on the ground. And it is possible that uh, to do that, provided that you want very much. 
Well, if we uh, do not make uh, happy and peaceful steps, and uh, with the eyes of the Bodhisattva, we can look into the footsteps of someone and saw and see the sorrow, anxiety, the fear that uh, the person has left in his footsteps. So we must be able to make steps in which no trace of sorrow and anxiety can be found, only peace and joy. Suppose uh, I have a, a miraculous power, I would like to bring you to the pure land of Amita Buddha, uh, if you are Christians, to the kingdom of God. But once we are there, how shall we walk? Shall we print our sorrows and anxieties uh, on the land of Amita Buddha? That way we will pollute the pure land, and the pure land will become impure. Uh, therefore, it's very important that we can make uh, peaceful, happy steps re uh, right here on Earth. And uh, as you can make uh, peaceful, happy steps on the earth, the earth becomes the pure land. And that is something I do not uh, invent. That is said by the Buddha himself. The pure land is in our mind. Also, the samsaric world is in our mind. It depends our way of making steps that this land is a pure land, or uh, the samsaric land. Uh, many years ago, I visited uh, the place where the Buddha stayed. I climbed up the mountain where he stayed, and I sat down on the rock that I believe on which he had sat down several times. And I contemplated the sunset that I believe that he had contemplated hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. And uh, I had the feeling that if we cannot uh, walk like the Buddha, sit like the Buddha, look at things the way the Buddha look. And then you cannot continue the work of the Buddha to afford this world with awareness, with understanding, and with love, happily, serenely. Boy, mm. I were an eternal. Did you know that Geico has even... I think the little lizard's a pretty good disciple. <laughs> Oh, yeah. My, um, my invitation is to you know, bring that, that, that mindful, prayerful, um, experience to to your daily routines to school to work to church see, see who is there see who's around you and bring that, that love and compassion to people um thank you oh th that's the uh, one of the things that, that compels me about this is this idea of ritual. Um, whenever, uh, so I, I'm, I'm with in difficult situations daily with families of people that are hurting or sick. And so I have, um, I practice 
Uh, sometimes they're small, just, just a simple prayer, maybe praying the Lord's Prayer. I have just a moment, maybe it's the sign of the cross before I enter into one of these kinds of spaces. And then I have prayers or music that I'll listen to or pray after. But this idea of having um, some practice that can, can sustain you, that can protect you, that, can, that you can go carry with you as you're going into this place where you're, you're touching the pain of the world. Um, ritual has been very, very meaningful for me. Um, I just share that as well. Thank you all for, for being a part of this conversation today and, and your, your call to discipleship be clear and supported. And thank you for being a part of my, my discipleship. Yeah. <laughs> for, for letting me contribute to you and letting me experience your contributions. <laughs> All right, God bless you guys. Thank you. I live there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a hospice chaplain with Alina. The hospice in oh. Novotel. I um, lived in Arizona for seven years. Oh, wow. Back in the 1980s. Okay. And Steve Judd at that time, he was a big deacon in the church. Oh, okay. I have the same church as St. Paul. Yeah, and that was in the day of Dick Taylor. And Don't forget to turn off Zoom. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Juanita.